Well, since October, I'm finally getting around to putting up a video. I hope you can hear me above the wind and the rustling leaves and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a question I got earlier last week that, you know, I have these live streams. I'm going to have another live stream this week, I think. I have these live streams and people come up to me with random questions and comments and things. And one question I got was, have you ever heard of Gilbert Ling? And I had to say, no, never heard of him. Don't have the slightest clue who he is. Um, so then, of course, I had to jump in the rabbit hole and do some digging and try and find out who the heck this guy was. Uh, it's a sad story, actually. So anyway, who is Gil Gilbert Lang? Well, first of all, he was a Chinese scientist. He was born in 1919. He studied in Chinese colleges in the 1940s, which I imagine was a pretty rough time since they're dealing with a Japanese invasion at that time. And he won a scholarship of some sort to go to the University of Chicago and do graduate studies there. So clearly he's a smart guy. So he goes to the University of Chicago and he works with Ralph Gerard, uh, who I had heard of, didn't know much about him. Uh, but Gerard and Lang had gotten together and they made a glass capillary microelectron. So they developed these, these ubiquitous, common, ordinary electrodes. Now they're common. We take them for granted now. Uh, but apparently they were kind of a breakthrough at the time. And doing things like being able to record electrical signals from cells. And uh, it made his, made his name. So anyway, smart guy. Then what happens? Well, he gets a bad idea in his head, and that occupies him for the rest of his long, long life. It's, um, that's why I say it's a really sad story. So, what did he figure out? What's the idea that got in his head? Well, whoa, I had to come inside to continue this because, man, it's loud and windy out there. So we'll take it from the top here. Let's talk about Gilbert Ling. His first good idea was working with Ralph Gerard and figuring out how to reliably make those useful glass microelectrodes. What this is is an extraordinarily tiny glass needle. They're made by taking thin walled glass tubing, heating it, and then drawing it out to produce a fine tapered tip. How tiny? The point of the needle is smaller than the wavelength of visible light, so all you can see in a microscope is a diffracted blur. And it's so sharp that you can stick it through the membrane of a single cell without destroying it. You can then use it to measure voltages and currents across the membranes, or to inject small molecules into the cell, or you can use it as a knife to do microsurgery. In my postdoctoral work, for instance, I started every morning by making a dozen or so microelectrodes and filling them with a dye, lucifer yellow or rhodamine dextran or dye eye, there's lots of these, and then spending the day sitting down at a microscope, pinning down grasshopper embryos, clamping a microelectrode to a micromanipulator, and microinjecting single cells with glowing fluorescent dyes. So I can be appreciative of the fact that Ling helped develop this incredibly useful tool when he was a graduate student. Thanks, Dr. Ling. Unfortunately, his career takes a dismal tour turn after that high point. He has written extensively and repeatedly about what I consider his crackbot origin story, the moment when he turned to the loony side. And here it is. It was a failed graduate student seminar. On a spring afternoon in 1947, I was standing on the podium in the main lecture room of the department, waiting for my late-coming audience to settle down. The title of my talk was The Sodium Pump. I began with an apology. I told my audience that even though I had thoroughly searched the libraries 
I had no worthwhile information on the sodium pump to share. It was just a name. I then went on to other related issues. When I finally stepped down from the podium, I was startled by what happened next. Two of my highly respected professors each individually took me aside and used almost the same words to tell me. Gilbert, you don't want to make yourself a martyr. Leave the sodium pump alone. It is a sacred cow. I thank both warmly for their concern about my personal welfare. At the same time, I also felt that they were overly worried. Next thing you know, I was doing some simple bread and butter experiments to test the validity of the membrane pump theory. This is a remarkable claim at an interesting time. In the 1930s, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley had begun their biophysical research on the electrical properties of the cell membrane and had hypothesized that those properties were a product of ion fluxes across the membrane via regulated and specific channels, driven by gradients of concentration differences. With the interior of the cell being low in sodium and high in potassium, and conversely the exterior environment being high in sodium and low in potassium. They postulated the existence of the ion channels in the sodium pump, but this being well before the development of molecular biology, the actual proteins involved had not been isolated and characterized. It was a sound hypothesis though, backed up by a solid theoretical framework and many observations of the behavior of ions in isolated cellular preps. Their work was interrupted by World War II, but resumed promptly afterwards and were the best known and most successful scientific collaborations of all time. They would publish their Hodgkin-Huxley model in the early 1950s, a mathematical description of how changing conductances in the membrane that produced action potentials in nerve and mu muscle fibers, and it would win the Nobel Prize in 1963. It's an extremely powerful predictive model for how the electrical activity in cells is generated and has been tested over and over again and is so successful it's mostly taken for granted now. It just works. Be warned, a theme is developing. All those people who had ideas con contradicting Ling are going to be winning Nobel Prizes. Man, that must have burned. So, you know, here's Ling in 1947, after the preliminary work had been done, and before the grand theory of the Hodgkin-Hoxley mod model had been validated, standing up and boldly declaring that a key piece of the model was non-existent, and further, that the scientific literature was entirely lacking in worthwhile information about it. Yikes. He was wrong that there was nothing in the libraries about it. There was over a decade of research that demonstrated its existence mathematically and with data about the distribution of ions. But okay, it's 1947. He's in that awkward gap between preliminary prediction and physical confirmation. Even in 1947, though, he's bucking against the evidence, and his professors know it. I don't trust Ling's characterization of their response. What I suspect was going on was that his professors were more aware of the evidence than he was, that they knew what data was coming down the pipeline, and were trying to warn him against unwarranted arrogance. That arrogance is his downfall. He spends the rest of his career cobbling up theories to demonstrate that the sodium pump doesn't exist and couldn't exist even as the rest of the scientific community was triumphantly demonstrating its existence. The pump itself, the sodium-potassium ATPase, was isolated and characterized in 1957 by the Danish scientist Jens Christian Skow. Right up to the time of his death in 2019, Ling was still calling it the hypothetical sodium pump and was denying, denying its existence. I think he refused to accept that he could have been wrong in 1947, and his hubris blighted his entire scientific career. He might have been brilliant, but his ego sidetracked him permanently. What interested me is how someone could deny the overwhelming evidence for the membrane pump theory, as he called it. I should be used to this now after years of confronting people who deny evolution. <laughs> 
What's unique here is that Ling didn't build his ideas on a religious presupposition, but assembled increasingly absurd contrived models for how the cell works to, I think, shelter his ego. That's what's interesting, his bizarre explanations for how cells generate concentration differences without a pump. So let's take a quick look at that. We can distill it down to a simple fact that is not in contention that Lang agrees to. Cells have a strong concentration difference in select ions across the membrane. Sodium, to name one, is high outside the cell and low in concentration inside. How does that happen? The prevailing explanation before Ling's seminar, and since ever more strongly confirmed, is that there is a pump in the membrane that burns ATP for energy and exchanges sodium for potassium. Simple, right? And we now know that this pump is a physical protein that has all the properties predicted for it. The question then is what will Ling propose as an alternative? How do you generate a concentration difference without pushing ions around? Uh, he came up with something he called the association induction hypothesis. One of his first assumptions is that the cytoplasm of the cell is highly structured, a gel-like matrix of proteins that makes the inside of the cell less fluid and more like gelatin than a bag of water. This is valid. I don't know anyone who would question that. It's what I teach and have for decades. So far, so good. Ah, uh, but the next claim that the water in the cell is also highly structured. It forms strong associations, that's half the name, with the proteins in the cell and is no longer fluid. Then, because water is a dipole, its electrical properties induce, there's the second half, induce changes in the charge distribution in their associated proteins. Now we're getting on shaky ground. The idea that water molecules have structure and align themselves to the environment isn't weird at all, but the conclusions he draws are. According to Ling, as a consequence of these changes in the cytoplasmic proteins, potassium is attracted to and is bound to the interior of the cell, displacing sodium to the outside. No pump is required. The ions flow in response to the chemistry of the cell to spontaneously generate the concentration difference. That's all nonsense, I'm sorry to say. Water does form structured relationships with proteins and carbohydrates and lipids in the cell, but they're transient and they exhibit a great deal of flux. Water is not locked up in any way by these structures. It still flows fluidly within the matrix of material. Ling tries to argue that no, water is trapped and unable to flow in the way the membrane pump theory expects by making an analogy. He compares a sponge and a hamburger. Everybody knows what a raw hamburger is like. From its rich water content, it resembles a wet sponge. And it is also quite different from a wet sponge. Squeeze a wet sponge, water comes out. Squeeze harder, more water comes out, until finally the sponge becomes almost dry. If instead you take a raw hamburger and try to squeeze the water out of from this water-rich material, you will find it is well nigh impossible to squeeze any water out, even after the meat has been chopped into tiny pieces. Indeed, we carried on this line of inquiry in a more rigorously controlled manner. So this exceedingly simple experiment adds yet another set of evidence showing without ambiguity that the basic tenet of free water in the membrane pump theory is wrong. The cell water cannot be normal liquid water. Where the, were the cell water truly normal liquid water, it would have been extracted along with the indisputably normal liquid water held in between the muscle cells, which is quantitatively squeezed out. What remains would be nothing more than, a, than dried proteins like a fully squeezed out sponge. But that does not happen while the cells are still alive or close to being alive. Ah, uh, yeah, there are a few problems with this rationalization. The first is that it's an invalid analogy incorrectly interpreted. The second is that he's reduced to trying to dismiss the mathematics and data of Hodgkin and Huxley with a clumsy analogy. 
It is true that squeezing a lump of hamburger will not produce as much water as squeezing an equivalent lump of sponge with the same water content. But that's not because water is so tightly bound in the hamburger. It's a difference in the compressibility of the matrix. The sponge contains large voids full of water surrounded by relatively elastic fibers and can be crushed down to a much smaller volume. The lump of meat contains many proteins with numerous but much smaller microspaces for water. It's far less compressible, so you can't easily squeeze out the water. But that does not mean water is unable to flow in the tissue or that it's not normal liquid water. In fact, fluid flow through cells is surprisingly dynamic. Remember when I was making all those microelectrodes and filling them with a fluorescent dye? What I'd do is poke that needle into a single cell and then use a little current to inject a small amount of dye into the cell. It would then almost instantly flow throughout the cell, even into fine dendrites. It would do so within seconds. The gel-like consistency of the cytoplasm doesn't seem to inhibit the free movement of water, ions, and small molecules. Ling also has an unusual perspective on another molecule, ATP. The rest of the world thinks of ATP as a molecule that mediates the transfer of phosphate bonds to other molecules, as an intracellular signaling molecule, or as an energy carrier that can be cleaved by hydrolysis to release energy that can drive other chemical reactions. Wrong, you fools! Its job is to act as an absorbent to bind water and induce it into an active state. So Ling says, thus far we have dealt with the associative aspect of the association induction hypothesis. Equally important is the inductive aspect, or electrical polarization. Thus, in the AI hypothesis, the living cell is essentially an electronic machine where the electronic perturbations are not carried out through long-range ohmic conduction of free electrons along electric wires, but by a falling domino-like propagated short-range interaction. In the association induction hypothesis, it is this basic electronic mechanism which not only permits such key components referred to as cardinal absorbance to sustain the protoplasm of closely associated proteins, ion, water system in its normal resting living state. It also provides a mechanism for cardinal absorbance to control the reversible shifts between active and resting state. The cardinal absorbent per, par excellence is the ultimate metabolic product, ATP. Hmm. This ubiquitous and crucial small molecule is once wrongly believed to be carrying an extra energy in the so-called high-energy phosphate bonds. However, there is no doubt that ATP is strongly absorbed on certain key sites, cardinal sites, on cell proteins. Indeed, the absorption energy of ATP on the muscle protein, myosin, even exceeds what was once wrongly assigned as a phosphate bond energy, and this high absorption energy fits like hand in glove in its central role in polarizing the protein water ion system, maintaining the assembly in the living state. <sighs> okay, don't ask me to explain that diagram. It's a vague mess. It's what he uses to illustrate this somehow. And that's a lot of gibberish that ignores the importance of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation in metabolic processes. But it leads into his next bold claim that the difference between living and dead is how their water is structured. Note also the concept of the living state, despite its occasional plebeian usage by other investigators, you know, he comes across in all of his writings this way, as this, as this extremely arrogant person, uh, is uniquely a concept of the AI hypothesis. Being in the living state specifies what is living. Transition into the dead state specifies what is dead. Uh, that's, that's a really useful definition. Okay. Uh, in the living state, all the major components exist in their closely associated high negative energy and low entropy state. In the dead state, water and ions are to a large extent liberated and exist as free water and free ions with a large entropy gain. In death, the proteins enter an internally neutralized state. As already mentioned, there's no corresponding concept of what is living and what is not living in the membrane pump theory.
I, I don't think that's what the membrane pump theory is trying to do, but okay. Also, I guess hamburger must be alive then, since it clings to its water so tightly. You know, there is, there is this strong element of jealousy and resentment in his tirades. He's irate that Scow, who I mentioned earlier for his work in identifying the sodium potassium ATPase, the, the pump, won a Nobel Prize for his work. They passed over, uh, they passed over Ling. He does, also doesn't like the chemiosmotic hypothesis, which explains how mitochondria use proton gradients and proton pumps to drive ATP synthase and make ATP, which is only an absorbent anyhow. And he thinks the Nobel, Nobel Committee was discredited by giving a Nobel to something that is only a hypothesis. A Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded in 1978 to English scientist Peter Mitchell for his chemiosmotic hypothesis. To award a Nobel Prize for an as yet unproven hypothesis is unheard of. To the best of my knowledge, and barring this one, no Nobel Prize has ever been given to authors of hypotheses before they have been proven valid beyond question. Uh, yeah, at this point, chemiosmotic hypothesis has been shown to be valid beyond question. The chemiosmotic hypothesis was intended to provide a mechanism for the postulated membrane pumps, but Mitchell seemed totally ignorant of the vast amount of experimental evidence against the very existence of such membrane pumps. To what extent he was a victim of Glynn and Carlish's cooked review, and other cooked reviews like it, in which all evidence against the most prominent sodium pump was completely left out, I have no way of knowing. Not surprisingly, the chemiosmotic theory soon became the target of one disproof after another, none of which stuck. Uh, but for the reputation and credibility of the Nobel Prize, as well as Peter Mitchell, these proofs came too late. The prize had already been awarded. Oh, man, the resentment just oozes out of his words. Uh, the chemiosmotic hypothesis has been thoroughly tested experimentally and is still holding up just fine. It was more than just a hypothesis. Mitchell and his colleague Moyle had demonstrated with multiple elegant experiments. It was far more rigorous than Ling's wild ideas. He's also mad because the NIH long ago stopped funding his crackpot research, which is particularly awful, he thinks, because we still haven't cured cancer or AIDS. The reason? It's because researchers haven't adopted his association induction hypothesis. One result of this foot dragging is the wars on cancer, AIDS, and other deadly disease have not been guided by a correct cell physiology. Worse, they have been misguided by a wrong one. The reader can figure out for himself, herself, the horrendous cost which must be paid for this foot dragging, recalling that on an average day, 1,500 men, women, and children die from cancer in America alone. Okay, that's what sour grapes looks like, isn't it? Uh, Ling died a few years ago, which means that this foolishness is going to fade away, right? Sorry, no. This kind of stuff is contagious. Wherever grifters lurk, you'll find people eager to embrace anything that denies conventional science so they can replace it with their patent nonsense. What's handy about Ling's ideas is that he rejects the role of those pesky proteins in cellular metabolism and makes it all about water. Structured water. Water is cheap. Its structure is typically invisible. The opportunities for profit are immense. Get ready for a familiar con. We are studying the central role of water in health. We are two-thirds water by volume. In terms of the percentage of molecules, that two-thirds figures computes to a lot of water molecules. More than 90% of our molecules are water molecules. Evidence suggests that those 99% don't merely sit as the background carriers of the more important molecules of life, but are central participants. All that the cell does depends on water. This leads to the hypothesis that proper hydration is a central feature of function 
and therefore of health. Uh, those are the words of Gerald Pollack, a professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Washington. Oh, my alma mater, I am so embarrassed. Anyway, he's bought into Ling's notions wholesale. I actually agree with all that's up there. We are mostly water. Most of the chemi chemistry of cells involves water. And sure, it's a good idea to stay hydrated. However, Pollock takes a long step beyond the evidence. He claims to have discovered a new form of water, H3O2, that he calls easy water, short for exclusion zone water. He thinks it is specially constructed water that forms whenever water contacts materials and is also an intermediate step in the conversion of liquid water to ice, and so it's enriched in glacial meltwater. Ah, don't be impressed by the fact that he won an Emoto Prize. That's a prize handed out by Masuru Emoto, the guy who had a period of some fame a while back for his claim that talking to, or thinking at, or showing pictures to a glass of water would cause it to form appropriate ice crystals when frozen. If you think nice thoughts at it, you get aesthetically pleasing ice crystals. Think negatively and you get ugly crystals. Yeah, that guy. Uh, I would not be bragging about ever winning an Emoto Prize. I'd be kind of embarrassed by it. So alarm bells should be ringing in your head already. Let's just seal the deal on whether this is quackery or not. Here's Pollock again. Informal discussion of the evidence for the role of water and health appears in an interview with Dr. Mercola. Uh, and a recent lecture dealing with easy water and health is found here. Uh, and a grant proposal submitted earlier to the NIH contains a more formal discussion of the evidence. We are actively seeking funding to carry out a comprehensive study of the role of water and health. The public seems hungry for this kind of information. With our background in water chemistry and biology, we feel we are well equipped to carry out those studies. Who knows? Easy water may become the next wonder drug. Oh, man. Oh. Let me catch my breath here. That's horrible. Anyway, that's Dr. Ling's legacy. He has provided a pseudoscientific rationale that quacks and con artists like Joe Mercola can use to sell water as a wonder drug. The most interesting thing to me is how to make what I discovered to last to the future generation. Because the worst condition, when I pass away, the whole thing will just disappear but I intend to be long, here a longer time. <laughs> this is precisely what Ling wanted, that what people would pick up on his notions and spread them far, away, far and wide. So thanks for listening, and don't let people get loose you and sell you magic water. It just doesn't work. And uh, I'll just say, this, the tragedy here is that Ling was clearly a very smart guy. he got this idea at an early time when people were just beginning to formulate the principles that are going to describe cell biology and neuroscience and all that kind of stuff for the next forever how long. So he's, he's there in the midst of it and he gloms onto the wrong idea, which is fine, that happens. You just have to learn to let it go and follow the evidence. And unfortunately, he couldn't do that. So he spent the rest of his life clinging to a bad idea, watching all the alternatives, get all the praises and the awards and all the great stuff, and essentially taking over modern biology, which they deserve to do because they were good ideas. His ideas, not so much. Oh well. So I will let you go with that. You know, click the old little like and subscribe buttons if you want to hear more of this kind of stuff from me. Uh, I am going to try to do it a little bit more regularly, even if rather informally as I'm doing here.
Okay, I may have to walk home fairly soon before I get blown away. It's a regular windstorm here. Talk to y'all later. Like I said, I'm probably going to do a live stream on Thursday of this week. So check back for that.